Hello everyone, I'm delighted to welcome you to this session, which is the second in the series of six panel discussions on Oxford and Empire Travel and Translation. My name is Ben Grant. I'm a lecturer in English Literature at the University of Oxford's Department for Continuing Education, and I'm the organiser of this series along with Siobhan Daly. The series is under the umbrella of the Oxford and Empire Network, which is supported by the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, or TORCH for short, and it's also co-sponsored by Kellogg College, Oxford. This session is going to take the form of three speakers, each speaking for about 15 minutes, and then a discussion. And please do ask questions as they occur to you. You can write these in the YouTube chat. Today's topic is Oxford and the Americas, and the distinguished speakers are David Stirrup, Lauren Working, and Dexnell Peters. And the panel is going to be chaired by Patricia Daly. And Patricia is Professor of the Human Geography of Africa and Vice Principal and the Helen Morag Fellow in Geography at Jesus College, Oxford. She identifies her research interests as threefold. Firstly, contemporary forced migration and its relationship with identity politics. Secondly, how feminist geopolitics, critical race theory, and African feminist thought can together illuminate the ways in which race, gender, militarism, and violence intersect across transnational space. And thirdly, the relationship between conservation, resource extraction, and rural livelihoods within a political ecology framework. Her publications and keynote talks around the world are too numerous to list. She has also spoken at many community events and her media work includes acting as a consultant for an internationally screened documentary film on the genocide in Rwanda, Rwanda the Forgotten Tribe. On top of all that, she finds time to do substantial voluntary work, including membership of the Independent Advisory Group on Country Information of the Independent Chief Inspector of Border and Immigration and Chair of the Board of Trustees for Fahamu Trust Limited a pan-African social justice movement building organization. So I'll hand over to you, Patricia. Thank you, Ben, and welcome everyone. Welcome to the uh, to this session on Oxford and the Empire. And as Ben said, we have three distinguished panelists today. Our first panelist is Dr. Lauren Working. She's a postdoctoral researcher on the TIDE project. TIDE meaning travel, transculturality and identity in England, 1550 to 1700. She has an interest in Tudor and Stuart social ability, empire and material culture. Her first book, The Making of an Imperial Polity, Civility and America in the Jacobean Metropolis, Metropolis explores how English colonization transformed taste and political culture in early 20th, 17th century London. Today, she's going to speak on the topic from Jaguar animis animism to university play, translating American objects in 17th century Oxford. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia, um, and also to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present um, quite quite initial research, um, but which I hope is only really kind of scratching the surface of the kinds of things we'll find. Um, can everyone see my screen? Excellent. In the material world of 17th century Oxford, we'd find medieval chapels and wood dining panning, uh, wood panel dining halls, portraits, parchment, ink, grammar books, but we'd also find avocados, tobacco, parrot feathers, and Roanoke beads made from Chesapeake shells. As English colonists attempted to create a stable presence on indigenous lands in places they named Virginia, New England, Newfoundland, or St. Kitts, gentlemen in Oxford could stop by the printer Joseph Barnes Stall to pick up a copy of John Smith's Map of Virginia from 1612, or an account of the travels of England's Ulysses, Francis Drake, and his death near Panama. And here are just a few examples of the kind of material appearing in print in the early 17th century. So we have geographies and cosmographies by fellows of different Oxford colleges and John Smith's map of Virginia with an Algonquin word list inside. And 
This follows on from the late 16th century translations and travel literature, such as John Florio's translation of the voyages of Jacques Cartier to Canada and George Peckham's account of his travels to North America. And you can see that even in texts not necessarily printed in Oxford, there's often an acknowledgement of the kind of literary culture of Oxford in contributing to these translations. So Florio saying, that it was through the requests and solicitations of divers, my very good friends here in Oxford, that prompted him to undertake the translation. And similar here um, with Peckham's account. So there's been a bit of work in the last 10 or 20 years or so around Elizabethan colonial networks in Oxford, centering around the geographer Richard Hacklett and colonial promoters and colonists like Walter Raleigh and the mathematician and colonist uh, Thomas Harriet. But today I'd like to explore some of the ways in which imperial tastes developed in 17th century Oxford by focusing on objects and their context of use. Behind medieval stones and Victorian spires, a whole microcosm of indigenous lifeways persist, captured in beads, featherwork, baskets, deerskin, and jaguar claws now in the Ashmolean and Pitt rivers. I'd like to illuminate some examples of native objects in Oxford, but also to think about how indigenous commodities and imagery operated beyond cabinets of curiosity, to think beyond intellectual networks, to um, the context of use in which the ob these objects appeared and the political implications of these uses. So I'll just use one, I'm aware this is a 15 minute talk, so I'll just use one university play from 1618, Barton Holiday's Technogamia, as a case study to explore how American goods featured in students' lives. Exploring object trajectories and the way their function and significance changed as they were translated into English contexts reveals a process of interaction and alteration that allowed the English to develop imperial tastes. Um, and this places importance on sociability and performance in the dissemination of colonial knowledge and shines light on how gentlemen made the idea of empire fashionable beyond the library or debating chamber. Um, so what kind of Native American objects are we talking about? Um, there's a mix of raw and botanical goods as well as artifacts. So in terms of raw goods, some are found early on um, after the founding of the Oxford Botanical Gardens in 1621. And I'm really enjoying following the Plants at 400 project. Um, I don't know if anyone else has been doing this um, on Twitter where they've been showcasing uh, a range of plants and their relationship to the garden's founding. So by the 1650s, this included tobacco and sunflowers, as well as Persia Americana, avocado, and vanilla plantifolia, the orchid that produces vanilla. Um, and it would have been familiar to English readers of Spanish texts in the 16th century that described how the Mexica flavored their chocolate. Um, many of you who live in Oxford will recognize John Danvers 1633 stone arch, which in itself kind of frames how visitors would have encountered such goods. You walk through classical arch and over, um, over which reads, um, loosely translated, to the glory of God, the honor of King Charles and the use of the university. So bringing the delights of nature together with a belief in the supremacy of human order. Um, but we also find native crafted goods such as tobacco pouches, claw neck ne necklaces, moccasins and various types of feather work. In 1599, before becoming Archbishop of Canterbury, George Abbott, then Chancellor of Oxford, published his geography or brief description of the whole world, where he described whole garments made of feathers from Central and South America. These their greatest nobles do wear, Abbott wrote, being curiously wrought, and which now appears some of them being brought into England. Um, so this is some example of um, feather work at the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, a lot of them are later specimens. So they were collected by Oxford anthropologists in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, but they come from the regions that the English are attempting to colonize much earlier on. And some of them do actually date to this early period. So um, there's a Peruvian feather pouch here with the kind of feathers that have faded a bit into pink which still contains traces of coca leaves inside. Um, and while the Tradescant collection of global artifacts was only gifted to the university in 1677, 
Visitors to the university in the early 17th century also described native goods in the Bodleian's collections. In the anatomy school, students could visit the skin of a jackal and a rarely colored prodigious large parrot. In 1638, one visitor recorded West Indian idols and a portrait of Elizabeth in feather work, which I think might be a reference to um, the really exquisite portraits made by um, Mexica artisans comprised of very small vibrant feathers. And then in the Tradescan collection, you get things like the Virginian habit of bear skin, um, deer skins, coats, um, knives, feather work, things like that. So translation derives from the idea of carrying over. In language, it often denotes an act of cultural mediation, of carrying the meaning or spirit of a text into another, um, such as 17th century dictionaries or glossaries. But the OED also defines translation as the expression or rendering of a thing in another medium or form, the conversion or adaptation of a thing to another system. And it's this looser definition that I'm using to think about how Native American objects and motifs end up in student plays. So um, my example today is Barton Holliday's Technogamia, performed in Oxford around 1618, and again in 1621, for a very bored King James, who had to be forced um, to sit through the entire play. In the quite lengthy plot, a series of allegorical figures representing various art subjects, Historia, Ethicus, Astronomia, the Traveler Geographicus, and Poeta, with his servant Melancholio, all fancy each other and dart through the play trying to figure out who their ideal pairing is. But I want to focus on Geographicus, Poeta and Phlegmaticus, who comes on stage as a personification of tobacco, not unlike another Jacobean university play um, that I'll return to a bit later, uh, Thomas Tompkins' Lingua, or A Combat of the Tongue. But Geographicus is a flashy traveler. He's often in the company of fantasy. He appears on stage in a white beaver hat and satin suit, white pumps, and a mantle depicting the terrestrial globe in two hemispheres. Poeta appears in a black satin suit, black beaver hat, and a garland of bays around it. So this might just sound like a very typically Jacobean outfit, but we already have glimpses of global economies. Fur hats were made with the skins of North American beavers, the result of developing trade in New England and Canada. Phlegmatico appears on stage in tobacco colored clothing and tobacco pipes sticking out of his hat. And his first words are pure Indian. He goes on to sing about how tobacco is a traveler come from the Indies hither. It passed by sea and land ere it came into my hand. Um, so not the best verses, but I think um, what's interesting about it is the way that it equates the commodity to a passage. So. Um, an understanding of tobacco coming from other places and traveling to um, the hands of an Oxford student. So the play is useful in the way that it connects voyaging and discovery to a Native American commodity and its rituals of consumption. Tobacco is not, as in many cosmographies of the late Elizabethan period, described purely in terms of its use in Native societies. It has gone from being an indigenous ritual um, used for sociable or diplomatic as well as spiritual reasons to an element in displays of white elite sociability, a recognizable character in the story about university life, um, keeping company with poets and, and fashionable travelers. So while a play like this one is not overtly about empire, it's one in which the fruits of geopolitical exploitation and its links to sociability are manifest. And we might get further insight in how tobacco was staged in university plays by comparing this to Tompkins' Cambridge play, Lingua, which was printed in 1607. Tobacco appears with arms brown and naked, covered with Indian leaves, his face brown, paint, painted with blue stripes, in his nose, swine's teeth, on his head a painted wicker crown with tobacco pipes set in it, plumes of tobacco leaves, and led by two Indian boys naked. So we don't have a description of what the Indian boys looked like, but even the reference um, of, of tobacco demonstrates, I think, a lot of cultural translation and appropriation. The way the skin is darkened, but also painted in some kind of crude adaptation of Native American customs. The wicker crown with plumes of tobacco leaves, 
which seem to exhibit some knowledge of the basketry weaving used in um, some Native American headdresses and the swine's teeth on the nose, which I wonder if is meant to be a kind of stand in for jaguar bone jewelry that were worn um, by warriors in greater Amazonia, highly valued as a symbol of valor and gained with great risk. Such adornment allowed the wearer to identify with the vital life force of animal power. Um, and the Pitt Rivers Museum has some of these claw necklaces from Guyana. Um, so although this is just one way to approach ideas of Oxford and empire, travel and translation, I think goods and artifacts are a fruitful avenue for several reasons. The first is because their presence in or their influence on student performances might tell us more about how gentlemen imagined and confronted empire and placed themselves within the imperial story. Education is an important element of that. Um, we see that in the tangible evidence that objects present of those spaces that the English seek to colonize. Textual translations and university plays give us a glimpse of the role that English education and institutions played in fostering a sense of civility among the ruling elite in relation to um, a kind of burgeoning empire. And it's telling, I think, that colonists attempted to set up a university in Virginia as early as the 1610s, so only a few years after the establishment of Jamestown. We also get offhand comments like the one made by a captain in 1617, who reported that one Peter Alley brings news that Sir Walter Raleigh and his troops are now in the desired place in America. He was well received by the Indians. Some are now kings whom he formerly put to school in England. So it's striking this possibility that Raleigh in the tropical forests of greater Amazonia is reuniting with indigenous rulers and able to reminisce about the stone chambers of an English school. But to educate in the English way is also to seek to categorize people on a spectrum um, around ideas of civility and savagery. It's to desire goods from other places, but equally to disparage um, the people themselves who <laughs> produce those goods that are so desired. Um, so indigenous objects in Oxford, I think also invite us to have um, a more nuanced um, conversation about how these objects got here. Asking questions about provenance and taste can help us combat the enduring romance that I think this early period still often conjures. So we just kind of think about Elizabethans and Jacobeans tumbling around in their roughs, collecting shells, looking for lost cities of gold, trying to marry Pocahontas. Um, but instead, we can think more about the intent behind the knowledge and the curiosity. This is the moment when the English are laying claims to vast amounts of Native American land. And finally, Objects present themselves as artifacts that have rich histories of their own, ones that are entangled with, but also operate beyond ideas of empire. And I think it's that kind of multiplicity that um, is, is really interesting. Um, so this band of purple and white wampum from the Pitt Rivers is believed to have been part of the original 1656 Tradescan collection. Um, I don't want to say too much about it because I haven't been able to go and see it in person um, yet um, and to find out a bit more about this object. But I think it's just one of many um, that show us the anthropological value of objects that indicate the skills of Native American craftswomen and that embody the socio-cosmic regimes of indigenous worldviews and which present an opportunity to think more about how objects can be both, um, that they can signal the devastations of settler colonialism and still raise attention to questions about the object itself and the possibilities of seeing the object more as a living entity than dead matter. In Aztec poetry, including verses transcribed in the 16th century, beautifully crafted objects like poems preserve a sense of permanence and endurance. Here through art I'll live, one verse goes. Woven into the feather and the claw is the embodiment of a promise. In the eagle, the jaguar, we go with them. Our flowers arise in this place of rain. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was excellent, really fascinating. And actually, as a geographer, I became more and more intrigued by your presentation. Uh, not being aware of the role that uh, geographers played in Oxford early history of empire. 
Thank you. Um, if you have questions for Lauren, please put them in the chat. We will be um, you know, attending to them later. So um, I'm got, now going to move on to our next uh, speaker, who is uh, Professor David Stirrup. Hello, Professor David Stirrup is Professor of American Literature and Indigenous Studies at the University of Kent, where he's also Director of the New Center for Indigenous and Settler Colonial Studies. He's the principal investigator on the AHRC funded project, Beyond the Spectacle, Native North American Presence in Britain. And today he's going to talk to us um, in, with the title, uh, Oxford is a world where everything about my own world is alien. Native North American presence in Oxford. Over to you, David. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, and yeah, thank you to the organizers for um, putting this together. Um, so when uh, Ben, well, I was talking to Ben probably a year ago about um, our project and he asked whether we had encountered many students in Oxford. So when, when he asked me to um, speak today, I thought I would bring our attention back to, to students and, and native presence, not just in Oxford, but at Oxford University itself um, and so um, I, I just want to kind of highlight for you some some more recent uh, um, stories about that experience. Um, so in 1993 Scott Bear Don't Walk took up a Rhodes funded BA in history at Merton leaving behind the Crow Indian Reservation in Montana. In a long reflection on his experiences originally published by the Rhodes Project he explains I read the New York Times, the New Yorker, and I desired worldly opportunity, but I also wanted to put Native America on the world's map. His nation held similar ambitions for him. Again, he explains, because of our great poverty and great need, my tribe pinned so much hope on me. After I got the roads, local newspapers and radio and television trumpeted the story. I was a local celebrity and a hit in Indian country. Unlike other American Rhodes scholars around him, however, he hadn't attended an elite school in the States. Acknowledging the impact of uh, the shift from Montana to Oxford then, he writes, when I got there, I felt the alienation of a place unlike any other I had experienced. I was a fish out of water or a buffalo out of the tall grass plains or an American Indian away from his tribe. A sense of displacement reared up it wasn't just the crowded stone passages of the medieval city, nor was it the lack of mountains and truly wild wildlife, though I felt these things. Something was wrong with my orientation, the direction I was facing. In his moving account, he describes a feeling of drowning with one solitary moment of peace afforded him by his encounter with an absolute eagle feather war bonnet in the Pitt Rivers Museum give an entirely different talk about, about the Pitt Rivers Museum and, and particularly some of the really positive things they've been doing in recent years in engaging with Indigenous communities. But um, as I say, I wanted to focus on students today. So seeing the war bonnet, um, Scott Bear Don't Walk writes, cut through layers of darkness and transported him home. Shortly afterwards in 1994, he made the literal journey home, understanding that despite not finishing his degree, he'd already fulfilled the honor his tribe was so proud of. His experiences though speak very directly to the ambivalence of access for native students to the world of Oxford. Scott Baird Oak Walk was not the first Native American Rhodes Scholar. That accolade goes to William J. Smith of Choctaw descent sometime in the 1940s. He was followed in 1952 by Osage writer and scholar Carter Rivard. While outside the Rhodes, the claim to being the first known Indigenous North American student at Oxford goes to Mohawk doctor, statesman and athlete Oren Hayateka, born on the Six Nations Reserve of the Grand River in Ontario, Canada. Dr O, as he came to be known, matriculated at St Edmund Hall in May 1862, but returned to Six Nations a month later. It would take another 61 years before the first confirmed graduation of an Indigenous American student. In 1923, that student was John Joseph Matthews, another Osage writer who read natural sciences at Merton. His biographies refer to him as, quote, one of the first graduates of American Indian descent, suggesting that there may be others off the record, 
um, uh, uh, potentially, or at the very least, that the record is incredibly vague. Our searches to date have only revealed those five prior to the second decade of this century, since when at least seven further students have attended. I say at least because we can't account for those who attend without their indigeneity being publicised, and we've deliberately not sought to invade people's privacy, focusing only on public domain accounts and not on current students or residents of Oxford. And while those accounts, of course, reveal a multiplicity of experiences that reflects the diversity of indigenous nations, there are clear threads of commonality. In almost every case, and despite that 160 year history since Dr O's arrival, we see a catalogue of firsts, and those firsts create a kind of loop. On the one hand, the prior history of Native American attendance is so slight that almost every student who's written about, uh, written or spoken about the experience connotes through their firstness a sense of solitude and novelty in the eyes of staff and students. And on the other, that novelty ironically belies what Ojibwe historian Jean O'Brien identifies as the tendency of narratives of firstness to occlude or erase prior histories. Oxford, of course, was no stranger to Native North American presence, not least through the, the collections that, that Lauren has just referred to. Um, but in more literal terms, as other strands of our work have illuminated, that might be another complicating factor for those who enter the city as students. Precursors to Dr. O's arrival, for instance, include in 1844, a group of Ojibwe performers exhibited in the Star Assembly Room by the American painter George Catlin and Canadian entrepreneur Arthur Rankin, who lectured members of the university and the wider public on their customs and manners. In 1862 itself, the very year of Dr. O's arrival, Deerfoot, the Seneca runner, raced the English pedestrianist champions over six miles in the vicinity of Holywell Close. Wearing only a breechcloth, moccasins and a headband with a feather on it, Deer Deerfoot drew huge crowds as much for his exotic persona as his athletic ability. In turn, Dr. O himself, despite being versed in Latin and Greek, found himself scrutinized largely for his European clothing with its exotic embellishments of what the philologist Max Muller called his feathered garb. Many in the English press, meanwhile, refused to understand his fellow Mohawk as modern people, with journalists marvelling at the difference between his life in Oxford and his people's forest pursuits. That his manners were viewed in themselves as an exotic anomaly is abundantly clear since eight years later in 1870, Oxford papers were still referring to vandalising gangs of undergraduates as Mohawks, a common label since the early 18th century for lawless behaviour by well-to-do youth. And then in 1903, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show rode into town for two shows. Its highly visible cast of Lakota warriors central to performances of notorious plains battles on the Ifley Road. As with earlier instances, the spectacle was key and the image they cast very much fulfilled audience expectations, leaving a mark that according to the Buffalo Bill historian, Alan Gallup, was alive and well on the streets of Oxford at least as recently as 2009. That legacy of indigenous presence then, bound as it is in histories of objectifying performance, extractive gazes, and general ignorance about contemporary indigenous people, resonates in some of the experiences of more recent students at Oxford. In 2012, Kelsey Leonard became the first native woman to, uh, uh, sorry, the first, yes, the first native woman to graduate from Oxford, having also been the first Shinnecock woman to graduate from Harvard. Her portrait, the first of a Native American woman in the Oxford collection, hangs in the exams school. Painted by her sister Courtney, it was also the first of Oxford's portraits painted by a Native American artist. In an interview with the Oxford student, Leonard describes her experience of Oxford as unique and enjoyable, and articulates both her pride and a sense of responsibility at the symbolic importance of her firstness. Offering reflection on that firstness in a press release about the portrait, though, she explains that, quote, one of the greatest challenges was leaving my family and indigenous community to live and learn at an institution where I was the only native student. A consequence of that uniqueness then was that, quote, oftentimes I was the first Native American many Oxford faculty and peers had ever met. Strikingly, one Oxford representative spoke of the university's pride around their, quote, first Native American graduate the eraser function of firstness in action. 
The Oxford student interview piece about Leonard, meanwhile, belies expectations of indig indigenous students that if not quite of the order of earlier visitors, nevertheless reveals assumptions about a perceived tension between indigeneity and modernity, faintly redolent of Dr. O's experience. In it, the interviewer makes a point of assuring readers that her, stu her studies did not represent an either or between academia and respecting her culture, as if the two were antithetical. And of course, Oxford's implication in what indigenous scholars such as Linda Tahiwai Smith describe as the extractive role that research institutions have played in suppressing indigenous histories and disavowing indigenous knowledges, in turn presents an inevitable tension for indigenous students, which is nowhere more palpable than in the Rhodes Scholarship. Observing that students come to Oxford from around the world to quote, tap into something old and yet of this moment, Scott Baird don't walk articulates the jarring nature of the Rhodes legacy for students like him, as of course many others have in recent years. He writes, quote, England had been a great power and had left its mark everywhere. All of these former colonies and some former enemies felt a desire to measure up to the Oxfordian model of civilization. Wasn't this why Cecil Rhodes endowed his scholarship? In an account of earlier rejection by Rhodes selectors, 2016 Clarendon scholar Julian Brave Noisecat puts an even finer point on it where he writes that the Rhodes Scholarship wasn't designed or intended for me or my people, and that's why I wanted it so badly. Long ago, men like Rhodes decided that human players, uh, humans were players in a zero-sum game and that the resources and opportunities would not be ours but theirs. I imagined that when I won the Rhodes, I was, not, I was going to take it all back for, in, uh, for all of Indian country. Whether or not Bear, Bear Walk felt like he'd reclaimed the legacy from Rhodes, He's very clear about the long-term benefits of winning the scholarship. A view echoed by Rebecca Richards, the first Indigenous Australian Rhodes Scholar in 2010, who when asked her view on the Rhodes Must Fall campaign acknowledged, I would not have been able to afford to go to such an august institution if I did not take that scholarship. But the removing of the Rhodes statue is one of many things that, that can make Oxford more accessible to people of colour. It's a view that might be corroborated by another first, this time the first First Nations Rhodes Scholar from Canada, Billy Ray Belcourt from Driftpile Cree Nation in Northern Alberta, who took up an MST in women's studies at Wadham College. Like Bear Don't Walk, carrying the expectation of local and national press, as well as his community, he arrived in, I think, 2016 as well. Of the broader experience of studying at Oxford, Belcourt noted in interview in 2018, that there was, quote, this sort of dissonance that I identified in the people there, where they constructed themselves as intelligent, worldly, cultured people, while on the other hand, were actively perpetuating these quieter forms of racism, microaggressions, etc., that piled up. He goes on to describe casual racism and inattention to the ways indigenous peoples were represented in his course readings and how his peers conceptualized native people. These experiences all gesture to the various structural barriers of elite institutions that, to paraphrase Sarah Ahmed, allow the act of inclusion to maintain a form of exclusion. Belcourt's prose poem, The Oxford Journal, reinforces that ambivalence, recalling, quote, a world threatening feeling to be so other that you barely exist in a place whose imperial conquests sought the destruction of your people. Like Kelsey Leonard, Scott Bear Don't Walk and others, and in spite of these painful experiences, Belcourt acknowledges the importance of his status as a role model to other First Nations youth. Kelsey Leonard, meanwhile, has stated her hope that her portrait means that, quote, for those who do end up walking its storied hallways, they find comfort in the portrait knowing they too belong and are not alone in their journey. She cites the launch in 2015 of the Agnes Nelm Hari Scholarship for Indigenous students to take up master's study at Lineker whose first recipient attended in 2016, as signaling a possible horizon where native students at Oxford are no longer first and certainly no longer the only. And the scholarship website crucially promises to introduce recipients to other indigenous students. Among those students we know are board member Leandra Neffin, the first member of the Omaha tribe of Nebraska to attend Oxford, is a current, current carrier of that long legacy of firsts. Oxford, along with other British institutions, must surely build further on that not so hidden history and work with its indigenous students to build community rather than leaving it to each new arrival to navigate its fraught terrain as if for the first time. Thank you.
Thank you, David. That was a really, a really informative uh, presentation around uh, and on an area really that we know very little about, but also on the whole concept of firstness and um, the pressures that put on uh, those, fir those first people to arrive in an environment that um, is significantly alien from that which they um, come from. And I, I hope we will have lots of interesting discussions um, with respect to your paper later. Uh, and could uh, members of the audience please put your questions in the chat. And we will now, thank you, David, and we'll now turn to our final speaker. Our final speaker is Dr. Dexnell Peters. He's the Benneth Bosky Fellow in Atlantic History at Exeter College in Oxford. He's interested in the history of the Atlantic world and particularly the cross imperial relations of the British, Spanish, French, and Dutch Greater Caribbean. His current research project makes a case for the rise of a greater Southern Caribbean region, inclusive of Venezuela and the Guyanas. In the late 18th century, showing evidence for a very polyglot, cross-imperial and interconnected world. Dr. Peters is going to speak to us today on, under the title, Caribbean Decolonization Leaders and Oxford. Welcome, Dr. Peters. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure. Pleasure to be here today. Um, yeah, so I, as you can tell, my, my topic is a little bit different from my main, uh, my current research project on the Greater Southern Caribbean, but uh, it very much aligns with the, the, the broader issue of Caribbean regionalism, which I'll essentially be talking about today. Um, I'm mostly going to be concerned with uh, Grantley Adams, uh, Norman Manley, and Eric Williams, uh, all Oxford alumni who you know, known as the big three, were very prominent uh, Caribbean regional integration uh, leaders and independence leaders. They all became the first premiers of their countries as well. Um, and this presentation will briefly focus on their time um, in Oxford and the potential impact on later region, the later regional integration process in the Caribbean. Um, I'll go on to speak a bit about how uh, their time in Oxford sort of helped to increase their standing back home in the region. But, you know, it was sort of a, a complex relationship, you know, uh, uh, marked by some degree of isolation, racial prejudice, you know, this issue that was brought up by David about feeling like an alien. Um, their time in Oxford also sort of expanded their worldviews and, you know, ultimately played a role in the, the strong support for Caribbean integration from these three. Uh, so just to speak a bit about this issue of sort of increased standing, um, you know, and Oxford education certainly increased the standing of the three, you know, um, you know as they uh, re-entered into their societies. Um, and I'll just give a, a very brief example of Eric Williams, who was very commonly known, fondly known as the doctor. And so you will go on to see, you know, there are lots of sort of calypsos, you look at lyrics and so on, where, you know, he's being described as such, you know, deductor. And a lot of that goes to, you know, this sort of prestige and, yeah, this, this sense of increased standing that those like Williams, Manley and Adams received back in their uh, home societies. And as much as an Oxford education provided a degree of credibility within Caribbean society, it can also provide some distance you know, some that describe Eric Williams as having a chip in his shoulder. I have a quote here from Norman Manley. I read with some amusement writers who speak of me as if I was a product of urban conditions and pure middle class life, who declare that I could not put aside Oxford English and legal style. And he goes on to talk about, you know, ways in which he had a, a, a different kind of background. I could relate beyond this sort of. Um, middle class life and experiences and so on. So there are ways in which, you know, the, the association to Oxford increased credibility and so on, 
but it could also come with some sort of increased distance within society as well. And then to move on to this issue of sort of isolation and racial prejudice. Um, and, you know, some of this has been uh, fairly well written, and, but to, to, to mention briefly, you know, Eric Williams sort of very clearly outlined ways in which he faced racial prejudice at, um, in, in Oxford. You know, so this is a quick quote of him reflecting a bit later um, um, on his time at, at Oxford. Uh, a racial question was very much in evidence in, in the Oxford of my day, though naturally it was much less overt, much less vulgar than in the USA. Oxford, England can never be confused with Oxford, Mississippi, but one was made to feel it everywhere, on the cricket field, on the football field, in the junior common room, and I felt it at much higher levels. We know Norman Manley of, as well um, talks about you know, uh, his experiences of racial prejudice, particularly um, as he served during World War I. Uh, and you know, he goes on to talk about you know, his, experience, his experiences of isolation here. You know, so I am pulling a quick quote here again. I've not made a single friend here. I haven't fallen in with any sect or tradition. I've been an alien first and last. I cannot get behind a barrier that is always there. I feel chained. And so there's this experience of uh, Caribbean students in Oxford uh, feeling a sense of isolation at times, a time of uh, racial prejudice as well. Um, but then I want to go on to this issue of sort of the, the, the networks. And I have a, another quote here from Manny. This is sort of going on from that last quote that I read. You know, and he goes on to say that, you know, after talking about this sense of feeling like an alien and this sense of isolation, that the case is different when I meet any of the many West Indians that I know. I feel with them an altogether different person. Um, and we know that Manley Williams and, and Adam certainly met other uh, West Indian students. Um, sport may have been one of the, the potential avenues that, that this happened. You know, they were all uh, uh, reportedly uh, exceptional, of exceptional sporting talent. We know that Adams and Williams in particular uh, played cricket. And, you know, there, um, CLR James sort of once mentioned how people would sort of follow Williams around as he played uh, cricket um, in Oxford. So we have, uh, um, <laughs> um, so there's been mention of those sorts of uh, uh, sporting experiences. And that may have been one of the ways in which they sort of built up these sort of West Indian networks uh, in Oxford. So just to kind of give a very brief example of some of these connections through uh, uh, Grantley Adams, for example. So we know that um, while he was in Oxford, you know, he met uh, Noel Nevisole, who uh, attended Lincoln College, uh, who was from Jamaica. He later went on to become Jamaica's Minister of Finance, as a representative in the West Indian Cricket Board, and also served as an advisor to, to Manley. Um, Adams also met Beckles, who was Barbadian, uh, attended Exeter College, uh, who um, you know, went on to become Deputy Principal of Queen's College in British Guyana. He met this kind of Wall, Ward, sorry, who was a close friend of his. Um, who essentially uh, went on to become the Speaker of the House of Representatives of the West Indian Federation, which I'll talk about a bit later. But um, yeah, sort of a, a, one of the, the more significant regional integration efforts uh, within Caribbean history. And I talk about, uh, you know, I see here his connections to Sydney Bank, Bank Satima as well uh, from Guyana. So uh, well, in connection to what I was just referencing from Manly, feeling a sense of isolation, but then feeling a sense of at, at home and being able to relate to others from the Caribbean. Um, and I think one of the key points that I want to highlight here is their, spirit, their experience abroad and, you know, leaving their own country, but then feeling a lot closer to those from the Caribbean region. And I, I guess there's a sense in which this sort of built up the uh, connection to their Caribbean brothers, um, their, uh, a sense of uh, a greater desire for this, uh, the issue of Caribbean integration, I think, that would have been built during their time in Oxford yeah, as well. And so uh, 
going to move on to talk a bit about them as sort of proponents of Caribbean unity. Um, Adams, Manley, and Williams, no surprise, were very strong proponents of Caribbean regional integration. Um, uh, again, as I mentioned, sort of lightly encouraged by the West Indian bonds that they forged uh, in their time at, at Oxford and abroad generally. Um, of course, this idea of a greater Caribbean regional integration was also sort of bubbling up in the region. We know that the, the idea of a, of a uh, a, a British West Indian nation, which you know came into uh, fruition with the West Indian Federation from 1958 to 1962. Those ideas were sort of bubbling up well early in the 20th century. But Adams, Manley, and Williams became some of the sort of key proponents of this idea over time. So Adams, for example, was, as I noted, an early advocate for this West Indian federal idea. As early as 1938, he helped to draft a proposed federal constitution for the British West Indies. And of course, he would go on to serve as the first prime minister of the West Indian Federation, a clear sense of his um, dedication to um, the idea of the, the West Indian Federation. Manley, another uh, key proponent of this idea, and I, I pull a quick quote here of him so in, trying to sort of rouse support for the idea during a very crucial 1947 Montego Bay conference on close association in the West Indies. Uh, it would be an irony, the like of which history has never known that a community with that ambition of neighborhood, na nationhood having been offered this chance of amalgamation, which it's, is its only hope for a real political destiny, would refuse that offer. You know, he goes on to say, if West Indians refuse to leave their boats and get into that larger vessel, which is able to carry us to the goal of our ambitions, I say without hesitation that history will condemn it. Again, that link back to you know um, moving beyond their single boat to a larger vessel. And I'm linking that back to the you know his experiences as well um, in Oxford, connecting with others from uh, the Caribbean region. Um, you know that Williams as well, and uh, 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 another kind of key proponent of Caribbean unity, and his famous book Capitalism and Slavery, and um, uh, it's very, which you know stemmed from his dissertation that he wrote while in Oxford. And it, it, it's interesting to pull this sort of political line that's pulled that out as kind of emerges in the book Capitalism and Slavery. So yeah, um, he talks here about, uh, you know, he goes, I've taken a political line in the book. He, uh, he told the director of the UNC Press, which West Indians more than anyone else needed to hear. Um, Again, we see you know, this sort of uh, very clear political connection. Um, but as he was writing the dissertation, um, very much connecting it to the problems of West Indian society, um, problems that went beyond his own uh, connection to Trinidad and Tobago, but to the wider political region. And we see that in Williams, you know, his other works uh, as early as 1942, you know, he published the Negro in the Caribbean. Um, uh, there's clear support for this idea of political federation. So I'll pull the quote here from the book. Political federation was called for in the region, not only by economic considerations, but by every dictate of common sense. Not only political federation, but an economic federation of all the Caribbean areas is a path of statesmanship in the future. Uh, he wrote another book from Columbus to Castro, which was, as Professor Bridget Barreter noted, an ambitious attempt to write a truly pan-Caribbean history. So uh, again, just to highlight this sort of um, uh, proponents of uh, Caribbean unity that you know, we see uh, in Williams, Manley, and Adams very clearly. Uh, so again, just to, to conclude about the big three as they, they've been tombed um, in Oxford, you know, their time in Oxford certainly Help to develop their expertise, competence, and increase standing back home. We saw that can be quite mixed at times. Um, uh, and their time was also quite marked by isolation and racial prejudice. But this played a, a role in sort of expanding their, their, their worldviews. It played a, a role in connecting them even more to um, their uh, uh, others from the Caribbean um, and around the group. You know, is certainly uh, connected with others as well. And I think all this sort of played a role in the strong support that emerged from these three 
for uh, Caribbean regional integration. And I think it's, it's an interesting avenue for new research as well, sort of exploring networks of Caribbean students in Oxford and seeing, um, yeah, how that played into, you know, the process of uh, decolonization, independence movements, uh, regional integration, and yeah, we can, we can think about it even further. But I think it's an interesting link here, well, my presentation talking about sort of the, the later influence of Oxford on empire generally. So I think with that, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dexnell. Um, as a Caribbean person as well, uh, I have uh, some questions to ask you later, but I'd like to welcome back the other two panelists, uh, Lauren and Davy, to um, as we uh, move into the uh, Q&A. We have some questions coming into the chat and please do post your questions for our panelists. Um, we have, uh, let me begin uh, with Lauren, because there are a couple of questions there that I'd like to uh, start with. And one is, the first is from Michael, and it says, Lauren, you mentioned Thomas Harriet. Does Oxford have any material about his experiences in North America or anything he brought back? Um, thank you for that question. Um, I, Oxford does, the Bodleian does have some material. Um, I think I'd have to go back to the archives when we're allowed back to, to look a bit more at the manuscript material. A lot of it has been published in studies of Harriet. Um, he, his brief and true report of Virginia, which he publishes in 1598, 1588 and then an extended version of 1590 um, has a lot of detail about objects um, both related to trade and indigenous societies. Um, unfortunately a lot of the objects seem to have been lost on the way back so there's mentions of him losing diaries including drawings and descriptions and I would I would think specimens of, of objects as well and frustratingly those don't seem to have survived. Um, I don't think there are any other extant objects associated with Harriet. Um, it would be amazing to find them. But I think in terms of more writing, um, there are some letters between Harriet and the geographer Richard Hacklett about um, his interest in fostering empire. And you get um, Francis Walsingham, who's the secretary of state to Elizabeth, um, encouraging him to continue with his, his studies and to, to continue this work. Um, but the kinds of objects associated with that and whether or not any of them still exist, um, I'm not too hopeful, but I would love to find some. Thank you. Um, we, we have another question for Lauren, and if we, I, I'll just move on to that quickly. And I, uh, yes, and that is, yeah, it says, I'm not sure who this one's from. He said, would you elaborate on your use of the idea of translation and how it relates to the various strands of your rich discussion. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I have to thank the uh, Ben and kind of the organizers for, for, for leading me to think about translation a bit more in this sense. Um, I thought rather than maybe go the slightly more expected route of thinking about um, the, the translations of travel narratives in this time, um, I'm, I'm really trying to move forward in my work about thinking about, you know, if we talk about ideas of decolonization and we can discuss what we think about the term decolonization maybe later in the discussion, but um, if we're taking seriously claims to try to, to approach our subjects from different angles, I think um, I wanted to kind of move beyond text. And so for me, thinking about translation as acts of appropriation, as acts of modification, um, brings the intentionality behind kind of purposely changing objects and or the functions of uses of objects. Um, and I think just helps us try to think a little bit more differently about what it means to have something, the, the origin source or the um, points of origin and how different kinds of points of origin can be kind of existing at the same time um, in, 
in a kind of broader understanding of translation. So it's, yeah, it's all very new work for me, but I think it's a, it's an, it's a way into thinking kind of ideas of translations beyond text themselves and what unexpected things we might come across as a result. Thank you. Um, I have a question for David and it's, it actually follows David from on from Dexel talk, although I think I was thinking about it whilst you were speaking, uh, but <laughs> Dexel sort of gave an example of Caribbean leaders. And I was thinking about um, the indigenous scholar, um, students who came and how um, Oxford shaped their life post university. Did they use, I mean, cause there was, there's always this tension between the fact that you might not have a good experience in Oxford, it might be variable, um, but when you return, it takes on a different dimension in your home, you know, in your culture and home area. So perhaps you could tell us what you know, especially some of the earlier um, indigenous students in Oxford, how did their lives change as a result of um, studying here? Well, no, that's a, it's a great question. I mean, I think if I, if I go right back to the, the beginning and, and um, uh, uh, Oren Hayateka. I mean, he was literally only um, there for a month. Uh, he was in Oxford itself for about four months, but he only, he was only at the university for a month. It was a it was a real challenge for him just to just to register and 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 even persuade uh, his mentors that, to allow him to to study what he wanted to study. Um, but although he was only there for that month it lived with him for the rest of his life. And the, and the main mentors that he um, uh, made, uh, that befriended him in Oxford were, were friends of his for the rest of his life. Um, he, he would describe himself as, as an Oxford student. Um, he became a, a renowned physician. He became a, a, a statesman of sorts back in, in uh, Canada and, a, and a, a very prominent spokesman for uh, his people at Six Nations, um, uh, so it, it, it absolutely had a very, very clear and profound effect on him um, that he very deliberately and repeatedly um, brought back to, to Oxford uh, in particular, not, not just his, the fact of his um, uh, exceptional education, but, mm -hmm. you know, that tie to Oxford was clearly deeply important to him and, and very much part of his identity. Yeah, so in some sense, Oxford plays a role in um, in, in empire wide <laughs> uh, and in the colonial mind. And I don't know, I, just, I don't mean just the colonial, uh, the colonizer, but also the colonized. Mm -hmm. It has deep significance there, which then you know <laughs> influences how um, students behave, in, you know, after they leave. Um, which Dexel clearly illustrates for some of the Caribbean, um, you know, students who were here. But Dexter, I was wondering, I mean, I, <laughs> I should say I was a student here in the 80s and I also uh, had you know, transformative, you know, quite a transformative experience as well in the sense that I actually became more progressive, <laughs> I think, although I think it was there, but you know, I suddenly realized that, you know, I, I, I had to unlearn a lot of stuff and started learning again through, and I became more Pan-African as a result of being here. Uh, because I met students from Africa. And I just wondered, really, um, you talked just about the Caribbean students and did they make connections? Did these students um, here make connections with African students um, or with Caribbean students in London? Presumably they were, you know, there was a cohort of them across Britain. There was, a, there was a, yeah, that, um, you know, met up and had these debates about decolonization and, you know, and regionalism. Yeah, and no, I think uh, definitely. Um, I mean, I, I sort of try to, to, to keep the talk thinking about sort of the networks of Caribbean students within Oxford, but they certainly, uh, especially during sort of uh, summer periods and so on, would go off and, and travel and meet other friends. I know Adams, would, um, there's another Barbadian friend, um, Lionel Reeves, and he'd go off and, 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 and touch base with Williams, uh, certainly um, interacted. But beyond students, uh, certainly other close connections with CLR James, for example, who go down to, to London. And so there's evidence of them sort of stretching beyond Oxford and reaching out to others. You know, for William, um, CLR James, Larry Constantine, and so on. So uh, that certainly happened. Um, and I think it, it, it definitely sort of went beyond 
uh, um, uh, Caribbean students as well, and particularly the African students. I, I, I mean, they, they, the list of names is kind of eluding me right now, but um, I know certainly Williams sort of gone to, you know, all the, the, the significant sort of political debates, political events, um, but uh, where you'd have met, you know, several of these sort of Caribbean and African students as well. And so there is a sense of, you know, as you said, you know, you, you became a lot more progressive. Um, and I think they, they, they interact, they, uh, interaction uh, uh, with other Caribbean African students and all these sorts of ideas that were flowing during, uh, during this time, I think certainly uh, was very formative for them and developing their ideas and ideas of sort of you know, more anti-colonial attitudes uh, that emerged over time. So I definitely agree. I think it was a much similar experience. And in fact, just to quote, and there's a book, um, Colonial Students in in Britain, right? and you know, he talks about, you know, uh, for Caribbean students, there was sort of a declining prestige of Oxford and Cambridge, more towards the London University mm -hmm. as well, and, and an increasing sort of, you know, so several uh, Caribbean students would kind of emerge in, in London as well. So there's this, I think, yeah, there's clear evidence of these kind of wider networks of mm -hmm. African students emerging uh, in Britain throughout the course. 20th and later into the 20th century and so on. So yeah, just to, to agree with your your, your sentiments. Hey, okay. uh, we have we're having lots of questions in the chat, but there's a follow-on for you, uh, Dexter, which is um, were these big three connected to wide discussions of Pan-Africanism between the US and Africa? So it's the North American, did they get involved in sort of the Garvey movements and other movements um, that you know. Um, or did they spe specifically focus on the Caribbean? Yeah. Um, I think, yes, definitely. So, uh, for example, I uh, just to kind of give a, a brief example, I know that, uh, and this, one of the things I could have talked about in the, in the talk is the way in which their time after Oxford that they collaborated between um, leaving Oxford and, you know, this, the West Indian Federation that emerged in 1950, it was quite a lot of groundwork um, and working together. And we know that Williams was based in, in the U.S. at Howard University and certainly setting up uh, these ideas of Pan-Africanism and so on that were emerging. And I know in 1945, Adams and Manley toured the United States to sort of try to build support for this idea of a kind of West Indian Federation, but they certainly were connecting with others well beyond mm -hmm. uh, the Caribbean region during that tour. So yeah, I, I would definitely say, yes, they certainly connected with others. Um, uh, this idea of kind of Pan-Africanism emerging as well. Yeah, and a quick follow-up <laughs> before yeah, I turn sorry. <laughs> Quick follow-up before I turn to uh, David and Lauren. Um, yeah, there's a, Obviously, uh, there's a question relating to whether Oxford, in retrospect, had influence on the constitution or the character of the University of the West Indies. Uh, and I wonder whether you could <laughs> respond. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's a, that's a big question. Um, I, I was thinking about including some of that um, in the presentation, the influence in education. Certainly, I know Williams, um, uh, all of them speak very fondly of their time in Oxford and of the kind of educational experience. Williams flourished, he you know, enjoyed the tutorial system. And so there was this sense of fondness with it. And, and as you know, they all had uh, different levels of influence on the University College of the West Indies as it was um, called then. But there was certainly a closer, um, and looking at, I know Oxford was sort of looked at as a model, you know, and the way in which you have sort of a, autonomous colleges and the same way you have these kind of autonomous campuses, but I think um, the University of London served as even more of a, a, of a, um, a sort of model for the University of the, what would become the University of the West Indies, and there was, of course, clear affiliation to the University of London as well, but I think yeah. Oxford certainly had a, a, a role to play in uh, sort of influencing or early ideas for the university, and I mean, that's something I probably uh, deserves more research into yeah. And I, I think also the University of St. Andrews, we shouldn't forget they had um, considerable influence on the setting up of, the, of UE, uh, in, certainly in Kingston. Um, so 
Uh, we have a question actually for um, David, uh, following on from the discussion we had earlier, David it says, can you expand on the context in indigenous communities in, in the Americas that made Oxford uh, an appealing option? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, thinking back to, to Oran Hayateka, you mean, uh, I, yeah. in some respects, so so the, the Mohawk in the 1860s um, were um, far from the, the, the um, they, were, they were far from enjoying forest pursuits as the, the British press um, liked to paint them. Um, uh, and they were very much, um, very much saw themselves on, on a, a path of, um, I don't, you know, I, I hate to use words like, like progress and it's not the right word to use, but, but they, they absolutely saw themselves as an autonomous nation whose uh, relationship to the United States was, uh, and Canada was, was one of, uh, of equals, of, uh, not of, not of um, uh, uh, you know, inferiors in a hierarchy. Um, and so education for men like Oren Hayateka was, you know, a means of reinforcing that, uh, education within, within um, non-Indigenous um, non-indigenous settings was a, a means of reinforcing that and Oxford in some respects was was a kind of pinnacle of proof if you like that that he was absolutely up to the the, the kind of standard that the the, um, the colonizer was holding him to or, or insisting he wasn't um, he was actually um, encouraged to go there by his doctor Henry Ackland um, uh, sorry, by the King's Doctor, um, having um, served already as a as a as a, a kind of statesman for for Six Nations at the age of twenty, he was he was um, the man who was invited to give an, a welcoming address for the British monarch, um, and so in some respects, it was also the kind of encouragement of um, men of significant standing that he could join those ranks. Um, that, that sent him over there. One of the problems for him, of course, is that the, the na people like the Mohawk at that moment were very much kind of controlled by the, by the colonial structure, which was driven at Six Nations by missionaries. Um, and almost immediately, just the decision of him, uh, the, the, the decision he took under his own steam to go to Oxford created uh, immediate ire. Um, on the part of uh, of the missionary at Six Nations, and that was one of the main reasons he was forced to go back a month later because uh, the the missionary had kicked up so much of a fuss, partly about accusations that had already been disproven, and partly about just the audacity of uh, of Oren Hayateka in trying to make this move. Um, so, so there's a kind of real tension on the one hand of trying to to, to prove a, a standing and in uh, and, a, and an educational ability on the one hand. Um, and that attempt itself creating considerable tension in the colonial relationship back home. Um, beyond that, I mean, I think, you know, I think, I think particularly as we move later uh, and into the 20th century, you know, the, 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 the Rhodes Scholarship and, and universities like Oxford as the pinnacle of educational achievement are, are no different for indigenous students than they are for other students. They, they may be differently achieved, differently attained, and obviously have a different levels of significance in their home communities, but, uh, but, but you know, the same kind of ultimate goal of, of achieving educational excellence. Yeah, and, uh, and certainly from, you know, the Caribbean, education was a means of sort of making it within colonial modernity. And I, I, you know, I wondered whether the schools, because in the Caribbean, Dexel can probably say more about this later, uh, if you know. But in the Caribbean, the schools were modelled on sort of the public school systems here, so students would have had classics and, I mean, you know, been taught some of the you know, the same sort of curricula as that which was being taught at Eton or one of the top, you know, public schools. So, uh, you know, these are elite schools in the Caribbean for often for um, wealthy individuals, right? Or, or um, the merchant planter class, your sons and daughters, sons predominantly of the plant class. 
And obviously, probably the missionary, the mission school then didn't teach <laughs> have a similar curriculum. Is that what you're saying, David? You know, so, certainly, yeah. yeah, certainly. There's, I mean, you know, the the, the kind of education that missionaries mm -hmm. were were bringing into communities like Six Nations were were very much modelled on, you know, a, an English education. Albeit that there's an awful lot of assumptions being made about whether Indigenous students are going to be able to mm -hmm. to uh, to attain a kind of English level education. So. Um, not always the kind of emphasis on Latin and Greek that that Oren Hayateka himself uh, um, took on board. And in, in his case, you know, he was very closely befriended by the missionary until the fallout over his decision to go to Oxford. So he, he had um, a lot of, um, uh, you know, one-to-one -one teaching as well in, in the classics. And, and absolutely when he, when he, had, when he arrived at Oxford, uh, one of the most um, common things that's noted of him is his proficiency in Latin and Greek. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can I, can, I mean, beyond the Rhodes Scholars, um, were native, were indigenous uh, Americans sponsored to go, obviously they were sponsored to go to universities within the US. Mm -hmm. um, were they selected universities that they went to or, you know, or how? That's, um, that's a really, I'm not sure I can give a particularly good answer mm -hmm. to that. I mean, there are, there was, you know, going, going, um, there were so-called Indian schools. I mean, Dartmouth mm. itself, mm. Dartmouth College was yeah. established, um, and Lauren can probably speak to, to this um, better than me, but, but, you know, Dartmouth College was established initially, the, the idea of it, as, as, a, as a, a college for native students, albeit it very rapidly became something slightly different from that. Um, so there, there, were, there were kind of forms of steerage in that respect um, and there are obviously you know in the contemporary moment there are all sorts of scholarships available for mm -hmm. students to, to attend particular universities whether they be local universities with strong indigenous programs or or otherwise um, so yeah I mean I, yes is <laughs> the broad answer <laughs> thank <to> you <laughs> actually I was thinking about Dartmouth I spent I taught there for a brief period right. in the 1990s um, early 1990s and I can remember that history uh, we now have a question for Lauren um, which is uh, Kate, from Katie and Katie says several of the examples um, related to medical context the botanical garden the anatomy of the school were indigenous objects used in teaching and scholarship as well as sociability? Um, that's a great question. And I think, uh, my, I, I'm not sure, but I would suspect that in for, for medicine and for the kind of sciences, um, they very much would have been. Um, I, think that displays in the medical school um, or the anatomy school, for example, would be an example in which they did that. I haven't found direct evidence of how these objects would have been used in that teaching. Um, but I think that that would be a really interesting avenue of thought is comparing the kind of the more um, kind of logic based um, rhetorical um, literary projects. So we do have evidence um, in Cambridge, I found a little scrap of paper about a student's um, debate and they were debating whether or not Virginia can be colonized or not. Um, and the debate is carried out in Latin um, quite early on in the very early 17th century. Um, so I think there's these more, um, you know, standard, um, slightly more kind of theoretical debates the students are having, but I think also very much more that kind of hands-on um, cultivating botanical knowledge, um, cultivating anatomical knowledge. And we know that this is happening in London and other places. So um, my guess is that with a bit more digging, we might be able to find other examples. Um, I did come across, and I didn't mention it because it was just a bit random, but there was a fellow at Exeter College who wrote a poem that praises um, his friend who was a merchant for finding the antidote to poison in a Virginian rattlesnake. Um, so it's this really weird thing of, again, kind of using the, the resources and the life worlds of indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. but it's um, categorized as a kind of colonial knowledge that these gentlemen are finding themselves when they go and experiment. Thank you. 
Um, just following up on they go, <laughs> uh, uh, one of our questions, uh, first, I think the first question to, to you mentioned Thomas Harriet and voyaging to obviously the Americas. And I just wondered um, how many, you know, what was the scale of you know, travel from Oxford? Did students get infused um, and decide to, you know, um, explore? Um, you know, I'm a geographer and, you know, our, our department was founded by um, Halford McKinder in, you know, in the late 19th century. But obviously before that, people were doing what they call geography, which was really just description. Um, but nevertheless, yeah, um, who, yeah, is there evidence of movements, uh, you know, we know, sorry, just, I'm just going on, but we know that Oxford became a sort of training ground for civil servants. Uh, that's what Mackinder wanted um, in, you know, in developing geography education. But I just wonder, yeah, were others, you know, going into service at probably at a higher level than? Absolutely. Um, yeah, you see that from from this first moment. I mean, the, you know, the colonialism in the Americas comes out of the English projects to colonize Ireland, you know, around the same time and a bit before. And so there's definitely that sense of service to the state um, can be through these, you know, performing these kind of voyages to other places. Um, a lot of my work focuses on London, where I found a huge amount of, um, I guess it's a little bit what's come up in other discussions too, about the role of education in fostering a sense of civility and political authority. And so, um, there's definitely a sense that gentlemen feel that they're intimately responsible for kind of carrying out this colonial project themselves that you know we can't leave it to the merchants or um to just you know what francis bacon in his essay on plantation called the just um the wastrels and the prisoners that we want to send and so i think gentlemen really relate their education, which I think is why it's so interesting to look at Oxford and kind of how those ideas are, are formed when they're quite young and impressionable, you know, when they're teenagers. Um, but it, you see it happening a lot from London. And I think um, that that idea of civil service um, and kind of personal responsibility to achieve empire and maintain empire starts um, even earlier. And so Walter Raleigh um, goes to Guyana himself two times. So one in the 15, once in the 1590s, and once in, in the 1610s. Um, Thomas Rowe becomes a diplomat who first goes to Guyana, but he then ends up um, becoming an important diplomat in the East. Um, and all of these gentlemen were at Oxford first. And so I think, again, with a little more digging, um, not the kind of findings that I had about gentlemen in London and gentlemen at the Inns of Court will actually be found much earlier. And of course, if gentlemen travel, travel um, the odds are that they bring goods, but also people back with them. And so it's been difficult to find, I feel um, a little jealous of the other papers and being able to, to think about the indigenous perspectives and, and the peoples who kind of come from the Caribbean, who come from the Americas. Um, to Oxford and it's very difficult to find examples of that from an earlier period. Um, but I suspect that, you know, Walter Raleigh, well, we know that Walter Raleigh did have Africans and Native Americans in his household in London and whether or not those kinds of connections extended to, you know, gentlemen traveler, travelers to Oxford or spending time in Oxford, um, whether or not there were kind of earlier traces of a native presence is very difficult to, to know, but I think it's probably there. Oh, thank you. Um, you brought up obviously the issue of archives and the difficulty, and I'm just going to ask Dexter and David to follow up on that. How easy is, I mean, I'm a geographer and there are historical geographers who, uh, geographers are very interested in archives and we're, you know, and some of us are very new to that area. So yeah, how, what were your sources and what archives were available for the sort of work that you did? Uh, uh, David and then Dexter. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I ju just got, need to correct myself from earlier. Of course, it wasn't it wasn't the king that um, Oren Hayateka addressed. It was the Prince of Wales. Um, <laughs> I, I have lockdown brain freeze. Um, the, yeah, well, I, I mean, they, they are um, they're very difficult in this in this area. I mean, more more recently, as I as I mentioned, you know, where um, where students at Oxford have chosen to write about the experience you know those those materials are readily available and and a good old google search does uh, uh wonders but um 
uh, there, there are, of course, and we, you know, we, we know this about other universities around the country, there are an, an, a good number of Indigenous students who studied in the UK who have either deliberately chosen not to foreground their indigeneity or simply their indigeneity has not been recorded. And so um, the, that, that archive is, is or that catalogue, if you like, is only ever going to be incomplete. Um, and then for, for, for older materials, I mean, Oran Hayoteca is, is pretty easy to, to, to trace, but um, the, 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 the kind of largest repository that we've found useful for any uh, native uh, North American presence in the UK has been the British newspaper archives. Um, and if anybody has used the British newspaper archives for research, you'll know what a, a mess that can be, that can create. Um, so there are all sorts of false leads. Uh, we've, we've followed a, a very significant number, number of stories to the point at which it's become abundantly clear that the person we're following is a complete fraud. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, the, so, so I think the archive is, is decidedly patchy when it comes to actual mm. people. We, we, um, th there's, there's a really good body of scholarship in, in uh, the early colonial period mm. um, and a fairly good body of scholarship up until the end of the 19th century, um, although you know, there are lots of gaps in it. Um, and then from that point onwards, it's just like an explosion um, mm -hmm. uh, with very little gathering having been done. So yeah, it's it's been quite a task. Yeah, well, enriching as well. Um, oh, excellent. really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it's yeah. On, on one end, I think because I'm uh, this presentation looked at the big three who are you know um, fairly well known. They were significantly sort of prolific writers as well. So it's quite easy to kind of um, piece together networks around them to some extent. But then, uh, like David was mentioning, I mean, you can sort of Google root scholars and you know get a list of those that came from the Caribbean. Going beyond that, it gets it gets quite um, a lot more trickier. So in the case of um, Adams and Williams, they gained national scholarships, you know, and um, and ended up in, in Oxford. So it's a less easy to trace those that came from other Caribbean territories um, as well. And, and even as I was trying to flesh out that network around Adams, several of those other names, they don't just come up in a Google search. You know, a lot of, to, to, to get more information in them would probably mean going into college archives and individual colleges and so on, and to really kind of flesh out uh, a network of Caribbean students. And that's why I think it, it, it gets a little trickier. I'm, I'm sure it's there, um, there, there are things to be found, but then what is there to be found about their, you know, for, for, for some, unlike the Williams and so on, who probably wrote about their experience in Oxford, when we, we see some of the others on the list where you might get like a room register or those sorts of kind of official records, but to kind of flesh out more of their experience at Oxford, I think that's a little uh, tricky as well. So yeah, easier for some of the kind of bigger names, but a lot less, simple for to trying to go beyond these sort of more famous heads of states and so on. So yeah, a mixed bag really. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We're almost, um, I don't know if Lauren had anything quickly to add because we're, uh, we, no, if you don't. Um, <laughs> that's no, I, I just, I was wondering when, um, you know, Daxnell and David are giving their papers and, and, and a little bit of the research I've done, I do think it might be fruitful not just to think in terms of Oxford, but to think about mm -hmm. the separate colleges and their own archives and their own associations. Um, I have, it seems that actually Exeter College, which is also my college, um, does have quite a few early colonial promoters who, who write um, quite a bit more than others. So it might, might be a fruitful avenue for further research is this kind of specificity of some other colleges. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat, but I'm not sure it's directed to you or to me. Uh, so I'm not going to ask you to answer it because we're close to time, but I will read it out. And it's from Tim. And he said, there's a new body of work in geography, inverted commas, that is focusing on commerce and cartography. Are you aware of the importance of Oxford geography in inverted commas, that, you know, obviously not the discipline, but um, development and the notions of mapping the empire? I, um, I, I know of geography's, Oxford geography's relationship with empire, but 
uh, but yeah, I'm look, I actually, Tim, do send us uh, more information about that project. Uh, we can circulate the information in the chat. Uh, so let me now, I'd just like to thank our present panelists. Uh, really excellent presentations and stimulating. And, you know, Oxford is obviously keen to study its role in empire. And you, you suggested some really amazing ways which we can take this project forward. So thank you very much indeed. I'm now going to uh, hand over to the organizer, uh, Ben Grant. Ben. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, uh, as, as Patricia said, a really fascinating discussion and uh, to, to reiterate uh, her thanks to all the panelists and I'd like to thank Patricia as well, who's chairing the panel so uh, wonderfully. It was a really, as you say, rich discussion. Um, so yeah, I'll just close then. I mean, uh, just to say that the next panel is going to be next Wednesday uh, at the same time and also on the YouTube channel and it's on Oxford and Oriental Studies. And the speakers for that are Vishka Sinha, Siobhan Daly and Elizabeth Grass. And I'll be chairing the panel myself. So please do join us for it. Thank you. And thank you also to everyone for all your questions and comments in the chat. Bye.